Welcome back to my budget app series, where I attempt to create a personal finance application from scratch and document the process on YouTube. Last video, we created the authentication workflow in the web client, the Next.js web client. We created a sign up and sign in views, as well as a gating mechanism for views and a token authentication system in Next.js using JWT web tokens. In this video, I'll continue working on the web client, more specifically with the budget view and the core functionality of the app, which is creating budgets, category budgets, transactions, doing all of the CRUD operations on transactions and categories, etc. I was very hesitant about the way I can present this video so that I give you the most valuable information about the creation of the web client in terms of architecture, in terms of coding style, in terms of just the overall state management, rendering, and the organization of the web client. I could not make individual videos with the entire live coding session where I create the web client simply because it takes a lot of time, a lot of refactoring. I rewrote the code around maybe 10 times. That's just how I like to do front end development, especially Next.js applications because I initially write a very repetitive, clear code just to satisfy my requirements. And then I refactor and refactor multiple times until I reach just the perfect level of abstraction compared to avoidance of code repetition and still understandable code. So the version you're seeing is a result of development as well as multiple refactorings, rewritings, the final format of the video I decided to do is to show you the core components of the app, not a live coding session. Rather, we'll talk about the components, the Next.js layouts and how I will achieve and organize them, as well as state management mechanisms, the actions which will actually make the HTTP requests to the RESTful API to actually modify data, and how all of these layers interact. Basically, I'll explain the components and the layers of the app and how I have decided to structure it as well as other possibilities for Next.js app architectures, which might suit your app better. Because this is specifically for the budget app, which has a specific set of requirements. There's no perfect architecture, as you know, only the perfect architecture for what you're trying to develop. So without further ado, let's jump into the code, into diagrams, and I'll explain everything as well as I can. All right, so I have a couple of tools open to explain as best as I can. Let's start with the design. Let's go back to the main dashboard view to explain what we're actually implementing in the client. So currently, since last video, I mean, we made the login and authentication views, which include the sign up and the login. And I can walk in now and go to the budget view, which is this view essentially, everything under the budget navigation item, uh, which is also the budget route in my Next.js web client. There are a couple of characteristics of this route which are important. First of all, the main layout, which I would call the main layout, the sidebar navigation plus the content to the right is shared between all views, which means the budget and settings views for now. We don't have any other views. This is a user panel, which won't be a separate view. It will be some kind of a pop-up, which will appear. I still haven't designed that or worked on that. Currently, it's just a walkout button. But the important part is that this layout with the sidebar navigation and the main layout needs to be shared between a couple of views. For now, settings and budgets, but later, probably more views. Also, additionally, we need to have the ability to have other layout. And we already do need that ability because the login and authentication views, for example, don't have the navigation to a site. They don't need it. They just have a simple layout without anything else. They are centered on the screen and that's all. Now, let me walk in again, and I'll show you first how I've achieved that layout so that it can scale in the future. Now, the issue here, as we're using Next.js, we have the concept of layouts. So here is my source folder, 
We'll talk about actions, helpers, view models, all that later. Let's start with layouts now. Everything, of course, is in the app folder, all of the views, essentially, and the route. So focus on that. In next, we have the concept of layout. As you can see, currently, I don't have in the app folder, I don't have a page TSX, JSX file because I don't have a page in the root. In fact, in the next config.js, if you remember, I added a redirect from the root URL to slash budget. And budget is gated, so if you're not logged in, budget will redirect you to login. So that's the first decision I made. The root view will be empty. There will be nothing there. Now, the second decision, which will help me with the layouts, is that the signup and login are separate routes. They have their own pages and they use the root layout. The root layout doesn't have anything. It just includes the font and some metadata. Nothing special. Essentially, just the HTML and body tags and the class name for the font because we use a single font for the entire app, Leito. Now, these login and authentication, uh, login and sign up views use that layout because they don't need any layout. But if they needed to, they could have a separate layout here. If in their folder I create a layout TSX file, I can make them share a layout or I can create a separate folder for that. Now, the challenge here is I want my settings and budgets to be under the slash budget and slash settings routes so that I don't introduce further for the segments in the URL structure that are unnecessary just for a layout. That's, that's not cool. So Next.js allows you to create a folder in the app directory, which will not be a route because this is folder-based routing. If you enclose the name of the folder in parentheses, it's used merely for organizational purposes. But that doesn't mean that layouts don't work inside. That means that it won't be included in the URL structure. So what I have done is next to the login and sign up folders, I've created a main layout folder. And that's my plan for the app. The root app folder will include folders either for routes, like login and sign up, which don't need a special layout, or the uh, different organizational folders for layouts. This will allow me to scale to multiple layouts if necessary. Right now we have main layout, which includes a layout TSX file. And if I open that, it um, we developed this main layout uh, while we were doing the BWUI components library. You can go back to that video to see in detail what the layout includes. It's nothing special. Essentially just a sidebar with a logo and navigation and a container. That's a, a flex layout, nothing special really. And that's what we have here in the settings view. You can see it very clearly because settings doesn't really have much content, only it's still not developed. And in the budget view, we share that layout. It's the sidebar navigation and this container contains all of the children of this specific route. So here inside main layout, I have budget and settings. Each of them has a page TSX file and that allows me to create the two routes, settings and budget. And here in the navigation, to finish the layout, the, the nav links are a separate component because I'm actually not sure. Yeah, for organizational purposes primarily. And they just include the, they use the Next.js link component with an href. The sidebar nav button was reworked to be able to include a custom component instead of a button so that it can be used with Next. And I just passed that component as a prop. That's basically it. It's nothing special. We developed the UI components in a separate video. You can go back to that if you're interested. This video is about composition and primarily state management, which we'll get to. But I wanted to do this remark about layouts because this is a very good way to manage layouts in Next. First of all, let's see what, what, uh, at what state is the application. Here you can see the design. If you remember correctly, we have the budget switch, which switches the current budget period or what we call budget in our database. A budget is just a month for which we add transactions and category budgets. And then below that, we list all of the ca main categories, category types, income, expenses, debt, and savings. We have a couple of data types here to visualize. And I have done that using the data grid component we've built for data grids to be specific. And additionally, we have what we call a transaction, which is to the right right now. Later, it will be to the bottom right when we add the reporting module to the top. Right now, we only have the transactions grid on the right. 
and the ability to create transactions. Additionally, all of these support the full CRUD operations. They have the edit functionality and you can also delete an item. And of course, add. You can add a transaction from this button and this one, which share the same dialog, which we've created also in the BW UI. This uses a form and you can add categories right here for income, expenses, debt, and savings. Additionally, you can switch budget periods, of course, with the drop down we've made. This will immediately switch between budgets and you can also create a new budget, which prompts you to select a month and the month to copy the budget categories from. Now, what's interesting here is I don't have a deletion for budgets that would be in settings. This is not a frequently accessed operation. Now, how uh, have we realized that? We have a couple of challenges here. First of all, global state management. Of course, like with any single page modern web app, we do need some kind of global state contexts, some kind of state management. Because think about it, transactions are changes to transactions are important to budgets. Changes to budget categories are important to transactions. All of these are reflected in both tables. And any change in data needs to reflect a state change to the other grids, essentially. Everything is interconnected, like with many modern apps. It's rarely that something is encapsulated in its own thing and you need to worry only about it. Now you have a couple of strategies here you can implement. The one I've opted to do was to prioritize reliability for now. And uh, prioritize reliability and the reliable state synchronization between client and server and think about performance second. Uh, so my priorities usually, not just for this app, but usually for all applications are reliability, of course, then maintainability and performance last. Because you can, you can basically optimize pretty much anything to no end, uh, sacrificing maintainability, which in simple terms means you don't understand the code anymore. It's so abstract and so complicated for performance reasons that you cannot maintain the app easily. And of course, reliability is most important, which includes everything that prevents bugs, everything that prevents downtime, crashes, exceptions. So I've really, when you, when you decide how to manage state, you, you really need to optimize between these three. Uh, you get sort of a triangle. You cannot optimize for everything. You need to do something in the middle that is good for all of these categories. And right now, I've gone towards reliability for the MVP especially. Later, I will do performance improvement slowly, incrementally, uh, and improve more the performance in the future. But now, I really want to avoid any issues and have a very reliable app for the beginning. So, here are the challenges. You want... Let me refresh. You want on refresh to server side render every data that you have. You don't want your client to render after the page loads. That's a bad user experience. Server side rendering, especially on initial load, is great in terms of user experience. The user doesn't want to see loaders, skeletons, whatever. That's not great. Now, to achieve that, you need to fetch data on the server, the initial data. And here's how I do that. I have what I call a model container. And that's in my budget view, models container. That models container is a very simple component that uses server-side actions, which are just fetch requests, fetch budgets. Uh, it's just a function that fetches budgets which an, with an HTTP request. So that component fetches the budgets and transactions Notice that transactions depend on the budget. So I always, the initially selected budget in the application is always the one closest in terms of its month, uh, in terms of its date to the current, the current time. And that's great because I can calculate that on the server without knowing who the user is even. Although I know who the user is, I could have a preference for that or save state. But for now, 
when you refresh, always the, the, the closest budget to the current month is opened. So I fetch all budgets, I find the closest budget, and then I fetch all transactions for it. Now, that allows me to have budgets and transactions when the page loads, and I don't need to fetch them after the, fetch, the page loads on the client. I can do it server-side. And that allows me to server-side render these grids so that I have a stable layout and nothing shifts when the page loads, which is a great user experience. Now, that model's container, let me start drawing the structure here. That model's container component basically uh, fetches data on the server. The initial data when the page loads. And let me just resize that so that I can fit all my components. It passes that data to two other actually three view models, as I call them, or models, whatever, data containers. This is the container uh, design pattern. You basically have a component that is responsible solely for managing data, which means state, global state for many components inside, plus some actions, state updates. I achieve these models. Let's see the budget model. They are in the view models directory and I have separated my view models by the data type in my server on the server side which means in the database also just my basic data type so that they scale well in terms of file structure and I have budgets category budgets and transactions for this view now here's how a view model looks there are many ways to achieve that it's essentially a class with a couple of methods and state. I have budgets, current budget, and a token that's passed to it. And that class, this same file, besides the class, also has a React context, the budget model context. And now we're already talking about client-side state management. Until now, the model container fetched data on the server. It passes that data to a client-side component, which is a model or whatever, view model, however you want to call it. But from this point onwards, the client manages data, which means all further requests will be made on the client and all data updates, state updates are client side or on the user's browser, essentially. And here you have a model context provider. This is just a wrapper for the provider React context item and a hook use budget model, which uses context. This allows us to use this hook, use budget model to access all of the properties of the budget model class, which are budgets, set budget, current budget ID, etc. And we have other methods. We have this refresh function, which refreshes the whole model, meaning refetches budgets. They are the core state of a view model is it's the data it stores. And in this case, it's an array of budgets because this is the budget view model. And the same goes for category budgets transactions, etc. When I said I am optimizing for reliability, here you have a couple of options. You could do the following. You could optimistically, for example, you get to a stage where you make an update. Here we have a category budget salary with planned 5,000, received 4,000. Let's say you want to update salary to salary number two, like that, the title, and this to 5,500. You make a fetch request to the server for these updates, one or two, these were two in this case, two fetch requests. When you make them, the server will allegedly update the database and return a response with the updated item. You could do two things. Either get the updated, just update the grid because the grid is getting updated either way. It has its internal state that's copied from the budget you received. And after you make the update, these are inputs, the state is updated. You just send the request and you could forget, optimistically forget that you send a request, the data is updated, you don't care anymore. This desynchronizes the user interface, but it's best for performance and user experience because the user does not wait for a response, the user does not wait for an update. The great thing is that it's instant because you send the request asynchronously, you forget about it, and the state of the page is updated instantly, the user perceives an instant update, which is awesome user experience, 
The problem is reliability because you don't know if the request completed successfully. You also, yeah, you desynchronize the state between the server and the client. And after a session of many updates, you might have a couple of failed updates that are built upon one another, which is not great. Alternative method is not do it fully optimistically. Just wait to receive a response from the server that the update is okay, then make a state update locally only to this item and do a sort of just a separate state update function. Now, this is great in terms of both performance and reliability. This is not great in terms of maintainability because you need to have state update logics on small update transactions. For example, this update to income salary, if it's salary number three, you can see that updates the transactions table as well. So on an update to a category budget, in this case, salary, you would need to send a request, receive a response that the request is updated successfully, update budgets, the budgets model, and then update the transactions model based on the new budgets. But if you don't want to send a request to fetch the transactions again and fetch the budgets again, you need to update them client side on the client, which also can have issues with state desynchronization. You cannot be sure if you have bugs in your client side update code. First of all, you have client side update code to maintain, which essentially duplicates what the server does, repeats that logic second time for performance and user experience. And if you have bugs, you get to state this synchronization. And the most reliable method, the last one, which sacrifices performance, but is great in terms of maintainability and reliability, is on state updates, like this one, salary number four, for example, 6,000. Just call refresh methods on the budget model and the transactions model, which fetches the data from the server. And it makes sure that the client is synchronized with the server. Now, this is not the best in terms of performance. You could improve that further. For example, you could make a separate method that is for refreshing a single item only. If you do updates, for example, that would be great. Then on addition and deletion, you would need to refresh the whole data because you care about structure then. That's one optimization you could do. Uh, but this is reliable. The most reliable state management you can build during these updates and it works great if you have data sets that won't scale to large amounts of data realistically we're talking about category budgets here which are user created and shouldn't grow for the user's usability because he'll be he'll have a hard time tracking many categories i don't expect them to be more than 30 40 maybe 50. here we're talking about data so if there are less than 1,000, I don't care, essentially. Uh, meaning this data is not going to grow exponentially. Isn't it? Where I'm not expecting 100,000 rows here. That will never happen. Transactions, although they are uh, more transactional, they, there can be more rows there. We're still talking about small amounts of data. These are personal finance transactions that are recorded by a user. Hundreds per month is a lot. So we're talking overall, seeing the big picture about small amounts of data. And for an MVP, it's perfectly fine to fully refresh models, as I want to, in my opinion, of course, as I want to optimize reliability. And then I'll make small improvements with next versions to actually improve that. It wouldn't stay like this forever, um, but that will happen during next versions. I want something very stable now. And refreshing the models on updates is what I decided to do for the first version. So this is essentially what I wanted to explain. The models container has the so-called view models for budget, category budget. Let me just scale that. Budget, category budget, and transaction. All right. All right, and these are all code by the models container and the models container importantly passes their initial data so that the initial data is rendered server side. And every other state update after that 
is handled client side without refreshing the page, of course. Now, the interesting part is I also use server side actions. So let me explain that. This is the next layer. So I essentially have three, la three layers and I think for a good reason. Now, um, here we have the budget view model. I mean, I'll talk about it because the, the view models are essentially pretty similar. Here we have category budgets, here we have transactions, but they all have the CRUD methods and some uh, state variables for storing arrays of data. And the budget model is a great example. Maybe the category budget model is an even better example, actually, but I'll talk about it as well. So the budget model, besides storing bud all budgets, which are fetched, first received as props from the server, or server side rendered. And then we have, we have methods to refresh or refetch all budgets. And for example, create a budget and see that create a budget action and what it uh, function and method and what it includes. Basically create a budget receives uh, a budget and the budget to copy from the two fields that are needed. And it calls what, it's, what is called the create budget action function, which gets the token and the data, and then it refreshes the model. So why this layering? Why an action? I have an actions folder with actions for each data type again. And if we see the budget actions, and these are Next.js server side action. So essentially, I execute all of my HTTP requests, basically, my, uh, most, most of my HTTP requests, to be fair, I think all, uh, on the server. Just not on the, I exec, they execute Next.js server side actions, execute on the Node.js application that is running Next, because Next also has its own environment server-side environment, which is calling my BW backend service, uh, Node.js application in a server-to-server -server communication. This all happens very fast because we're talking about things that are on the same network in the same Docker composition, essentially. And um, this is great because here I have my server, uh, my token, everything. I may, I'm using the Next.js server-side environment. I have my cookies. I can make the request. It's also great in terms of security. Now, this essentially means two network requests, actually. The first one is handled by Next.js, so I don't care about it. And they have optimizations so that they bundle UI updates with data received. So I'm not worried about that at all. I abstract it away and I pretend it doesn't exist. Although if you care, if you're optimizing performance, you should be aware that that exists. This is not the most optimized way to do it. This is great for reliability and maintainability, in my opinion. And I want to make that request on the server. So these actions are Next.js server actions that are included here. And they just fetch, create, basically all of the CRUD operations. Here in category budgets, we have create, delete, update. And in some cases, like the login, we can do them directly with the form, directly invoke an action without using the model, which is great. It's great because you avoid using any client-side state management. But that is if that is possible. If we have more complicated use cases, we use a model in between. So that's what I wanted to explain about my architecture. Here, the budget view model, let me zoom out, has what is called budget server-side actions. And the view model is in between. Okay. The view model calls server-side actions, basically, like this. And importantly, this, let me color code it in some way. Uh, no, I really don't like that. Let me go down. Can it? OK. This, let me make it bool. This is server-side executed on the server, this layer, the view models, are executed on the client, which I don't know to wait this cover, move it down. So this is client side. And again, the actions are executed on the server. So this is the architecture I have going on. And this, you might argue, is unnecessary. You could avoid that 
I would actually advise you to try to avoid layering as much as possible. I think each of these layers has its value because I execute server to server HTTP requests and I like that a lot for, as I mentioned, many reasons, primarily security, reliability, many others among many things. And I can also invoke these server-side actions individually without going to the view model if necessary. For example, with login, which is useful and it scales well because actions being separate from the view model means I can use them without the view model as I build more views in the future. Plus, but as I mentioned, you could avoid this completely. Let me just add the other server-side actions so that my diagram is complete. And we fully visualized my state management mechanism. This is my state management mechanism. And that's probably the most important part of the application. That's why I'm why well, I spent so much time explaining it. Now, as I mentioned, you could completely avoid one of these two layers, both the client side layer and the server side layer, but sacrificing some things and in some cases. In some cases, you might not be able to. For example, you could have completely avoid the client side layer if you only use server side actions for forms. This could work for you. If you're making an app which is very form based, you just have to create update data, you could directly call server side actions. You would have um, problems implementing good user experience in some cases because you would need shared state between components. You would need some client side manipulation of data to transform data. You would need view models essentially. If you're making a somewhat complicated UI like this, which shares different data, it shows progress, data is interconnected and not siloed between individual entities. But if your data is siloed, if your application is very conservative, it just needs to visualize data in different grids that are encapsulated, server side actions could work great and Next.js could abstract away uh, client side state management completely for you. Almost completely not really. It would exist. You just wouldn't have that much quote about it. You could avoid server side actions if you make client side requests, requests in the view models, which I decided to avoid to have separation between the actual function that makes an HTTP request and the model, the model of a simple component of a view, I think that's a good practice. In my experience, the functions that make requests should be individual separated. Uh, this is great separation of concerns. And they kind of pollute code that includes actual logic on the client because there is some logic on the client, you'll see. We avoid it as much as possible, but we do include it. It's an inevitable. So this layered architecture is what I've decided to do. And uh, I hope I was able to explain it sufficiently. And what we have as a result, let me just dive into the code a bit, is a page, which includes this model's container to provide the context for data. And we pass the token to it. Here we have the token because we got, uh, this server-side rendered page is gated under for authenticated users only. And uh, here we render two columns. Basically, this is the left column, which includes a budget switch, a new transaction button, and the four grids. And the right column only includes the transactions grid. And that is visualized right here. I've zoomed in a lot, but um, for visibility, the budget switch, new transactions button, and the grids. And here in the budget switch, we can switch budgets. Let's start with it. Uh, this is one of the more complicated components. Let's just co-opt some imports and functions here. But this is the actual component, budget switch. It takes the budget model. This is how we use that view model. Just use budget model. And then we have budgets and everything, the state. And here we see we map options from these budgets because we need to remap them. We need an option that includes a label, value, and is active state. And that's great. It happens in the component. That's all right. Just a single map function. Uh, we add a create button to the options, which has a different logic. It doesn't depend on buttons. It's just a last element in that dropdown. And we attach some uh, dialogue to it. Here I use the 
use dialog hook we built in BW UI to open dialogs like this and manage state of these dialogs. And here we have a submit handler. Let's go to the actual component. We have the drop down component from BW UI and the dialog to create a budget, which is also, you know, the components. I won't go in depth. They're already built. We have videos about them. And here on form submit, as you can see, we have a handler that just calls, gets the form data and calls the budget model in its method. And of course it closes the dialogue, but everything else is handled by the budget model, which calls server side actions and returns a response. But in this case, we do not care about the response because after we close, the budget model will refresh the budgets and the current uh, after selecting the current budget. So the categories will be refreshed, the transactions will be refreshed and everything is received from the server correctly. So the next uh, thing we have is the new transaction button. Here we have uh, ignore category budgets for now, uh, but basically again, a button and a dialogue. You see that a lot in the app because this is the user experience. Forms are mostly dialogues because they don't need to be a separate page. And basically this dialogue also includes a form with a couple of selects and inputs on submit. It gets the form data and sends a create transaction, uh, calls the create transaction function in the transactions model this time. And that function will, after I create a new transaction here, let's do that right now. For food, for example, it adds this transaction right here and it updates all of the models that depend on it. And that happens in the view model. Now, um, Next in the page are the grids. Let's look at their implementation. We have separate components for each one. This is for primarily for understandability. I don't want to go to abstract. They are not different components, you see. Uh, if I go to income, what income does is it uses the category budget model and it um, basically uses this component category budget grid with different data and props here for income, plans received, basic labels and the data. Uh, so this component essentially is the same for the four tables, but I have this wrapper component to basically separate these configurations and do the, um, and pass the data. It could be here in the page uh, root component, but it would pollute a lot the layout. And it's, it doesn't cost much to have a separate file for that. More understandable. Otherwise, it's not repetitive code. It's just layered code. Now, if I go to this category budget grid, it is somewhat wrong because it, it uses the data grid component and it has a lot of JSON to configure it. But nothing is special or extraordinary here. If you go to the data grid video where we build the grid, you understand every row here. We use the model, a couple of dialogues to delete and create. And basically these are the columns, title, amount, current amount, all of these columns I defined here. We have handlers for deletion, change. This is a change. And deletion happens like this with a confirmation dialog. And then we actually render a data grid right here with all of these settings. Additionally, uh, we have a footer here. And that footer is this totals row and the new income button. And the totals are sort of calculated here. They are, yeah, they're calculated here based on the category budget amounts. This is not that bad because we don't calculate transactions here. We receive each category budget with a calculated plant and spent, which is calculate the totals between these few items on the client. And yeah, we just render that in the footer. Besides that, we have the create category budget dialog and delete category budget dialog. These are these two dialogs. New category is one dialog to create a new one. And here it is. And this one is the delete confirmation dialog. They're standard dialogs from BWUI. And 
if I open them, they actually have the logic on form submit to either, in this case, we're in the create dialog, create a budget, which just invokes the category budget model create category budget method or delete. Very standard. Everything is just forms in a dialog. And on submit, we call the view model. That's the architecture. Now, uh, transactions are similar. There's something interesting there that I want to show you. Of course, the grid is different there. And in the footer, we have pagination. This is server-side pagination, meaning it's configured to have six items. Let me create a couple of items here so that we can demonstrate. OK, now we have two pages, seven items. We fetch from the server six items with, let me show you in the transactions action. Yeah, limit and offset parameters. So we fetch only six items. And when we click next, we send another request to fetch another six items. So full server side pagination, which again is not great in terms of user, uh, in terms of performance, but for such a small number of items, it's great. It will work awesome. And it's all on the server. It scales well, extremely reliable. Yeah, we have pagination. Besides that, the new transaction button here opens the same dialog as here. They have shared shared state. I think it was, let me show you. Whoops, somewhere in here, in the new transaction button. Oh, the state of that, yeah, the state of that item is in the transactions model. Exactly for that reason. Is create dialog open, set is create dialog open, so that it can be used from this data, gr data grid and this button. You know, it's global state. Here's a good example of global state. One button invokes the same dropdown, and the stateful to have it open or closed is global. That's exactly what I was explaining with the view models and why you need them. In case for cases like this, essentially, which are simple, but you need to handle them and be able to scale that global state. And besides that, this is the state we're at with the app. So I explained the component structure layouts and how I handle client side state and how we do actions and state updates. In if you want to explore in depth, uh, in depth, uh, check out the GitHub repository. All the code is there. You can spend time decipher everything, and write in the comments if you have any questions. I'll be happy to answer. If your question is very interesting and it needs a long answer and something I decide would be valuable to everyone, I might make a separate video for that specific aspect. But it was just too vast to include the development process because this architecture was achieved with many refactorings and rewritings, and it took a lot of time. And that's not practical to include in a video for a live coding video especially. Now, uh, in the next video, I will focus on, we have a couple of things left to actually finish the MVP or its initial stage. Besides testing, we will have videos for that, automated testing suits, deployment, etc. But for the MVP client development, we have to include this summary, which will be redesigned completely with a better visualization and the charting. Basically the reporting model, uh, module, as I call these two. Uh, but this won't look like this at all. I decided to do something more interesting. The chart will be entirely different in terms of chart type. I'll save that for the video. You might find it interesting, more interesting than a donut. And this will be, this will include a visualization, which stay tuned for that. Uh, we also need to include the search and filter, which would have to be server side because I have server side pagination. So that will be at a later stage as well. Currently, I have the core functionality, which is the category budgets creation and transactions. And I'm happy for that. Besides that, uh, besides the reporting, we need to create the settings view and the user panel dropdown, which will be further down the line. Probably not next, but the video after that. And then we'll have a couple of videos for maybe one or two videos max for testing, automated testing suits. And finally, a video for deployment, which might be interesting to you. All right, thanks so much. With this, I'll wrap today's video. If you enjoyed the content, don't forget to subscribe to get notified.
when the next video in this series is released. Take care.